Welcome to Nightmares and Grief, a place to explore and celebrate the darkness. Each episode, I'll read stories written by me, Derek Heisey. So settle in, check under the bed, and pour a drink for the skeletons in your closet. It's time to start. The Deepest Cuts I started hurting myself again. I stopped counting how many times I did it that week. It's easier to just say a lot to process it that way than to keep track. There's not much point to doing that anyway, except to know if I'm pushing too far. It was getting hard to hide from Jessica. Money was tight, too tight. And between the general stress at my job and the problems with Jessica's dad, I, I just didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know how to cope. How do you get over feeling like the world is collapsing around you? How do normal people handle the sense that their entire world is depending on them to be absolutely perfect? I can't deviate a single iota. There's not a single second in which I can falter. I have to be perfect. There's no other choice. Opening a wound to bleed releases some of that pressure. It's like I can breathe for a minute because the whole world isn't pressing in on me. I haven't told my therapist about the cutting. The last time I did, it didn't go so well. She got a little grim-faced and serious and the whole vibe of our conversations changed afterward. I became the cutter. I couldn't be anything else. When we talked about tensions with Jessica and money, she thought, am I going to hear about how he cut because of this next time? If I talked about how I had a tense situation with my boss, I could read it in her demeanor. Is this going to put him over the edge? She became obsessed, working me like a puzzle with only one solution. Her obsession became my problem. I got self-conscious about how my ailment was her highest priority, the apex of her focus. That was the worst, you know? Feeling like this burden I carried was someone else's burden, too, when I didn't ask them to carry it. I just wanted help. It's the nature of the disease, I guess. It's everybody's problem, even when it isn't. Makes me feel like an atom bomb. Like the nature of my existence is to scorch the earth around me. Anyway, the point is, I started cutting and I was looking for ways to hide it. At first it was easy. I used the bread scoring knives Jessica used to cut pretty patterns in the sourdough. They're thin and bendy so the the cuts they make are thinner than a hair. A bad paper cut, but deep. But it wasn't enough. It didn't do enough. The sharp, negative pain wasn't enough to alleviate the stress, to reduce the pressure. So I had to use a real blade. Part of me wishes I'd bought a knife just for this purpose, but I I couldn't spare a dime without raising suspicion. And remember, I was trying to cut without drawing attention. Jessica couldn't know. It would destroy her. Remember, it's a nuclear disease. It impacts everyone, even when it shouldn't. So I started using an old Leatherman I dug out of the camping stuff. It was still sharp. I cut along the back of my thigh, just below my glutes, slicing the same spot open again and again. I figured it was always covered, and when it wasn't, Jessica couldn't see it. I locked the bathroom door and stood in the shower, out of the way of the water, with my knife still damp from the rubbing alcohol. I flexed my legs and cut. You'd think the blood running down the back of my leg would feel like the water from the shower, but I'm telling you, there was a difference. 
was like lancing an uncomfortable blister. The pressure oozed out with joyful pain. I leaned into my palms, pressed against the tile, and wept silently. I felt so bad, it felt right. Once my moment was over and I carefully dried off, I had to dress the wound. Fortunately, we had an ancient first aid kit we'd bought from Costco years and years ago, so I had enough gauze and bandages. They do for the day, but I'd have to make sure I kept the cuts small enough I could cover them with a few band-aids if I had to hide them. I could explain away band-aids. Bandages look serious, though. I had the system down. Between switching to band-aids and making sure I wore pants whenever I was around Jessica, I hid my wounds well. No one knew. The problem came with the old dressing. I didn't have a trash can to throw them away so Jessica wouldn't see. I ended up hoarding them in my nightstand, saving them until I could find a time to toss them safely. I'd wrap the bandage around the gauze until it was rolled into a tight little cylinder, and I'd hide it at the bottom of the drawer. I was terrified Jessica would find them. I couldn't imagine the conversation without my hands shaking. The drawer in my nightstand was starting to fill up, and I was taking things out to fit more and more bandages, but I was worried I'd run out of room. Things kept getting worse, too. I had to be so strong for Jessica, so strong, because her dad really took a nosedive. So much so, she started making arrangements with hospice. I was barely holding it together with work and taking on more responsibilities. And then the pharmacy made a mistake with my prescription, which delayed it. I was pinching myself and twisting the flesh throughout the day just to get by, picking at the skin on my knuckles, cutting deeper and deeper with the Leatherman before my showers. I'd lay awake at night, running over everything until I passed out from exhaustion, and then I'd dream about my problems. My drawer was filled with bloody bandage bundles. I was anxious whenever Jessica went into the bedroom by herself, terrified she'd find them. If I'd thrown them away before one at a time, I could have maybe gotten away with it. The dread had clouded my judgment and now it was too late. I was certain she'd find my cash. And I found myself sweating during the day as my thoughts drifted to imagined confrontations on the day she stumbled upon the crusty parcels of gauze. The anxiety created an infinite loop of further anxieties. I cut longer and deeper. I needed more bandages. Until a solution fell in my lap. Jessica was going away on a business trip. She'd be gone over the course of trash day. I could dump all the bandages out. Flooded with so much relief, I didn't even need to cut the day I hatched my plan. A childish impulse clutched me the moment I dropped her off at the airport. I raced home, heart pounding, breath quick, and a massive, ridiculous smile across my face. At home, I flung open the drawer, spat on the bandages, and cursed them. That was a mistake. Since it all happened, I've read stuff about blood magic and the key of Solomon. I'm not going to pretend like I understand it, but I'm convinced that the blood, the energy, and the spit summoned it. I gathered up the bandages in my arms and after a few choice parting words threw them away in the big trash can outside. It took three trips. Anxious chains lifted from around my throat and wrists and the space around the never healing wound on my thigh grew warm. 
That night, I drifted off to sleep easily, without a single seed of worry rooting in my mind. But it only lasted a little while. You know that feeling when you're alone in the middle of the night and you're certain someone's in the house with you? Maybe not in the same space, but someone is there in another room. You can feel their breath mingle in the air, makes it taste different. Maybe something went thud on the other side of the wall, so you arm yourself with whatever you have handy, a a baseball bat, a curtain rod, a lamp, and you check all the rooms and they're empty. You check all the doors and they're locked. But when you get back in bed, you still don't feel safe enough to drift off. That feeling pulled me out of sleep like a hand around my throat. I scrambled upright in bed, clutching the blanket, wrapping it around my hands and pulling tight. I stared into the focusing darkness, seeking, my ears straining for the sound of shifting weight or stifled breath. It took a while to hear anything, but when I did, it wasn't any of those. Something dragged across the floor. It almost sounded like a lame leg being dragged across the carpet, but I couldn't see anything in the darkness. The sound lurched forward with eager energy as if it were a clumsy, impatient predator. It grew closer and closer, each step raising goosebumps along my spine until a form crept up along my wife's side of the bed. Stubby, clubbed fingers wrapped around the edge and hoisted itself up. Although the figure couldn't have been taller than two or three feet, it towered above me, and the darkness itself seemed to recoil at its approach, its jagged outline quivering with tense anticipation. I still hadn't found the strength to scream, but I had at last found enough to turn on my bedside lamp. In my terror had lingered the hope its light would chase away the nightmare phantom standing on my wife's side of the bed, but instead it only illuminated its grotesqueries. Bandages. The creature was made up of bandages, not like a mummy. Not like something wrapped in bandages, but instead like a vaguely person-shaped pile of bandages. My bandages. The ones I had thrown away. This creature was made from my bloodied bundles piled into the form of a monstrous doll. And it stinked. It bore the subdued stench of rotting meat, and as if to emphasize the features of its face, its mouth, teeth, and eyes were formed from living, squirming maggots. Greetings. It squawked, and as it spoke, the maggots of its mouth and teeth rearranged themselves to form the words like some grotesque stop-motion experiment. I heard your call. Paralyzed again, I could only flap my jaws as the creature reached for my leg. With a ginger caress, it stroked my thigh with its sticky, stubby fingers. Around its maggot mouth, the white insect secreted a viscous brown fluid in a gross facsimile of drool. The touch of its fingers became a groping hand pawing at my flesh. So much pain. So many wounds. 
tried to recoil but couldn't. The brown drool dripped onto my knee and slid down the side of my leg. So many wounds. How can I help you with them? What? I asked. It's a burden to carry them. One day you'll be nothing but tough scar tissue. There'll be no more flesh left to cut, even if you keep at the same place. It placed a hand on top of my thigh again, and the space on the bottom where I cut went frigid. My name is Sabnock. You summoned me with your blood. Please, I begged. I don't have anything for you. What do you want from me? You have everything I need. And I have something for you. It rose onto its legs and leaped over me onto the floor. Follow me. I have things to show you. Now I could move, but not by my own volition. My legs seemed compelled to slide off the side of the bed and carry me to the bedroom door, which Sabnock was too short to reach. My legs planted me firmly by the door. Sabnock looked up at me expectantly, gesturing to the doorknob. By my own choice, I turned the knob and opened the door. What I found on the other side was my living room transformed. Instead of carpet stretched soft, loamy earth, my furniture had been overtaken by thorny vines and the walls were overgrown with more of the same. Plants sprung up everywhere like a garden opening up into my apartment, blooming red, white, and pink flowers. It should have been beautiful. But there was something wrong with the flowers. They stank. At first, I thought it was Sabnock as he bore a similar odor. But as I wandered through the lanes of roses, I realized they weren't really flowers at all. They were clusters of bloodied gauze and bandages. The fetid roses emitted the same stink as a carrion flower. Sabnock inhaled deeply and exhaled with a peaceful sigh. <sighs> Beautiful. Every flower is another wound. Impossible. I haven't hurt myself that much. They're all your wounds. But what do you mean? The deepest cuts don't come from a knife. Sabnock reached out and stroked one of the blood-splattered rose bandages, burying his maggot face into the coagulated petals. It was small but intensely fragrant. This one is from your father. When your soccer team won the championship, he told you it wasn't because of anything you did. When he made you feel small and worthless, burdensome even, that's what this one is. In the hallway leading to the kitchen hung a heavy curtain of weeping branches drooping with tiny bandaged flowers. Sabnock held a handful of vines with the same delicate tenderness he had caressed my thigh and the maggots of his face rearranged into a smile. They secreted the brown fluid again. There was a time when you woke up every morning and your first thought was how much you hated yourself. Sabnock ran his hand down the curtain, knocking rusty pollen out of the gruesome flower's stamens. So many tiny cuts, 
So many little wounds. His saliva dripped from his mouth and into the earth at our feet. Would you like a tour? I know them all. In the kitchen, Sabnok fondled a meaty, almost tulip-shaped bulb. I, I, I told him my pass. Looking around, I could almost feel where they came from. Except for one. I smelled it before I saw it, which wasn't completely unusual since they all stank, but this one didn't stink. It cut through the musky, rotten fumes and delivered a sweet fragrance to my nose. I didn't have to ask which one produced the smell. When I surveyed the room, it became obvious. One giant flower, like a pitcher plant made of pale-toned self-adhesive bandage wrap, hung from the bathroom ceiling. It was taller than me. Its open mouth was lined with sharp, bony fangs, and its interior was lined with gauze soaking with dark, shiny blood. It bore the cloying stink of vanilla candles. And the bandages squirmed. They pulsed, flexing like the sides of some great beast, rising and falling like it was breathing, trembling as if in anticipation. I swear I heard it grumble or growl, but just barely, low like the background sound of distant power lines. This one is special. You've nurtured this one since you were very, very young. There were times you tried to cut it from the garden, but it's grown too strong. It's become too powerful for you to remove it. I didn't need to ask. I knew what it was. The massive, carnivorous plant of bandage and bone caused a deep, familiar ache to cry out in my heart. I reached out and stroked the great, hideous thing. You see? You see its pain? Its pain is your pain. It is not your enemy. No, I murmured, stroking the great sticky side of the bandage flower. It's part of me. This time I did hear a growl emanating from the belly of the pitcher plant, and the vanilla odor bloomed stronger. The plant descended from the ceiling low enough that I could peer into the well of blood at the bottom. In its reflection, I had a memory of my mother baking cookies when I was very young. I tried to sneak the vanilla extract. It smelled so good, I wanted just a little sip. The wound on my thigh grew cold. My mother's back was turned. She was chopping a bar of chocolate to mix into the cookies. I took a swig of the vanilla extract and spat it out, gagging. She whirled around to check on me. Her face twisted into shock and she advanced, knife spattered with melty, slippery chocolate bits and clutched awkwardly in her hand. I remember my mother tripping. She made a mistake, my father had said. She made a mistake, so she cut herself. It was an odd way to say it, and probably unintentional, but that's how he said it. Looking into the bloody scrying glass, I was aware of how deeply that clumsy turn of phrase impacted my whole life. She made a mistake, so she cut herself. The flower shuddered and belched a sickly sweet plume of vanilla-scented spores. I climbed.
climbed up its bandaged side and gazed into the dark pool of black-red blood. I wanted it to tell me more. I needed to understand more. I leaned over the lip, cutting myself on one of its teeth and dove in head first, awakening on my bed in a puddle of sweat. I clutched my chest and ran a hand through my hair. What was that? What kind of nightmare? I ran my hand over the bed, hoping and praying Jessica was beside me and that I dreamed up the business trip. I, I, I needed her comfort. I suddenly missed the days when she and I would tell each other everything, sharing all of our thoughts unselfconsciously, and I wondered what she hid from me for fear that it was too much for me to handle. The dragging sound returned. The wound on my thigh went icy and the stink of spoiled meat grew stronger and stronger until I gagged. It couldn't be. The bandage garden. Had it been real? I haven't finished showing you everything yet, squealed Sabnock, hoisting itself onto the bed. It scrambled across the sheets and placed its grubby hands around my wounded thigh. You left before I was done. Trembling, I sputtered, no, 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 no more, no more. I'm begging you, leave me alone. Sabnock shook his head eagerly. Come, come, there's more to see, there's more to know. Once again, my legs moved without my permission, swinging off the edge of the bed and planting onto the carpet. They carried me to the bedroom door, which I opened, this time against my will. On the other side was a labyrinth of light. I shielded my eyes against the brightness until they adjusted. It wasn't light produced, but rather light reflected. It was a labyrinth of mirrors. It wasn't made of a smooth single piece like a tunnel of one solitary mirror, but instead it was hundreds of panels. They didn't all reflect me either. Or rather, they didn't reflect me as I was. Each one reflected a different version of me from a different time, but here inside the maze, and in each one, I was receiving a different wound. Some of the wounds were physical. A, a paper cut, a thumb smash beneath the fist of a hammer, a pinky toe colliding with the corner of the couch, but others were deeper. More than a few came from high school. A lot came from middle school. Some came from my marriage. Most came from my dad. In one, I was a young boy hanging my head while taking a verbal lashing for vomiting. I, I had been feeling bad all day, home from school with a temperature, and I hadn't managed to get off the couch and into the bathroom fast enough. I spewed onto the carpet. My father had called me a dog and said he ought to rub my nose into it. I almost thought he would, too. In another, a seventh grader knocked off my hat as he passed, jeering, Shrimp dick! Later that day, I discovered Tommy the bully had invented a lie that someone had told him I had a tiny penis. Shrimp became my nickname until I graduated. I tried to navigate through the mirrors, and all the while, Sabnock shadowed me closely, its maggot face snuffling the ground like a hound on the scent. Find it. Find the one that cuts the deepest. It took a while, maybe hours, who could tell in that space, but... I did find it. I found the deepest wound. It seemed to be at the center of the labyrinth. 
There were two mirrors facing each other. In one, I wept at the news of my mother's death. In the other, I cut myself for the first time. The wound on my thigh went ice cold. Sabnok grew restless. It scuffled about the floor around my feet and clutched at my leg with its bandaged fingers. Give, give, give! Give it to me! Now surprisingly strong, it jerked a leg out from under me and tore down my pants. I writhed and bucked underneath it as the maggot mouth reorganized into a writhing tongue, reaching out for my wound, the wound which now gaped, wet, red, and puckered. It stank like rotten flesh. Sabnok's fat, white tongue lashed out to lap up blood as it ran down my leg. I felt maggots break free from the tongue's bulk and squirm over my skin, trying to burrow into my wound. It gasped between desperate slurps. I tried to wriggle free as I watched it drink, framed by the image of myself twenty years prior, grieving my mother, until finally a consuming rage overtook me. I flipped onto my back and crushed Sabnok beneath my weight. I grabbed it by the face and yanked it off. It screamed, raising a blood-curdling noise the likes of which I'd never even heard in my nightmares. I flung the creature and it thudded against one of the mirrors, cracking it, and at the moment of impact, every image on every mirror switched. They all showed the same version of me, and each of them moved in sync. It showed me sickly and pale, quaking and sweating, naked on my hands and knees. I didn't recognize this version of me. I had not lived this life. At least not yet. Pulling itself to its feet, Sabnok burbled, This is your doom. I shook my head, brow furrowed. What, what, what happens to me? Sabnok threw back its head and laughed. <laughs> you succumb to your wounds. <laughs> Every muscle in my body tensed, and heat flushed every fiber of my being. I, I just make a flesh wound on my thigh, you lying little freak. I infect it. <laughs> the maggots forming Sabnok's mouth secreted brown drool again. I infect your wound, and my children devour your black rotting flesh. <laughs> Enraged, I thought about all the times I opened myself, how I was trying to lose parts of myself each time, and I realized I was as mad at myself as I was at Sabnock. I glanced down the hallways of mirrors, watching myself convulse on the floor, weeping and puking, and I thought about the images that had been there before. I thought about the wounds I had incurred in my life. I thought about the pain I had carried and still carry. I thought about the things I did to reopen those wounds and how sometimes I opened them on purpose. I turned back to the creature with an animal snarl. Then I launched myself at it. It shrieked and scrambled away, but I swung a foot into its torso. When it connected, Sabnok exploded into a shower of rotten, stinking wound dressings like a grotesque party popper, and I thought that was it. I thought I was done with it, but his squeal amplified through multiplication like a hundred versions of him cried out at once just slightly before or after the other. Each 
spent bandage that had made Sabnok scurried to life the moment they hit the floor. Like scarabs, they rushed toward me. My first instinct was to crush them beneath my feet, and it seemed to be a good one because they crunched beneath my heel like dry bones, screaming. The sole of my foot was sticky with their blood-red guts. Some of them managed to scurry at my pant leg, and I scattered them off with terrified, frantic flails. They screamed, Runes! We crave runes! There were too many of them to crush one by one with my feet, ignoring Sabnok's creatures scrambling up my legs, digging in like leeches into my calves, into the back of my neck and my thigh. I sought a weapon. I looked frantically around the mirror maze for anything I could use. One of the panels showed me getting hit by a teammate with a baseball bat during batting practice when I got too close. I slipped on the red putrid guts of one of the bandaged creatures and fell into it. With a crash, showered in shards of broken mirror, I fell into an alcove. Inside the alcove was a baseball bat. I gripped the bat and swung it like a golf club against the monsters, flinging them two or three at a time into more mirrors. Upon impact, they squirted strings of red which bifurcated the spiderweb cracks their collisions made in the mirror. When I had fended off enough of them that I could move freely, I swung the baseball bat into the time I went camping with Jessica and burned myself trying to start the campfire. And in the alcove behind that mirror blazed a dancing flame. I kicked Sabnok's monsters inside or whacked them into the fire with the baseball bat. They screamed with every hit, writhing in agony as they smoldered on the pyre. I advanced into the alcove and ignited the end of the bat in flame. I swiped the fire at the creatures on the ground, torching them and brushing off the ones attaching themselves to my body. I burned them, too. The labyrinth echoed with the chorus of their screams obliterating every one of Sabnok's miserable little bandages was exhausting, but I got them. Where once there had been a cacophony of anguish bouncing off the labyrinth walls, now there was only silence. Silence and the crackle of fire. I tossed my makeshift torch to join the creatures on the fire. I was done. My arms and back ached. My eyelids drooped, weighing more than they should. Maybe I should just take a rest. A short rest. I had earned it. Curled up on the floor, I drifted off to sleep. And awoke in my bed. I assumed it was a dream. Of course I did. There was no way any of that was real. But when I checked the drawer beside my bed, the bandages were gone. Except for one. A maggot flailed about blindly on the stained gauze. Without hesitation, I squished it between my thumb and forefinger. I don't cut anymore, though sometimes it's hard. I realize, though, my wounds are nothing to be ashamed of. The layers of scar tissue have built me into the person I am today, the same person who defeated a monster. I'm proud of those scars but I understand I don't need to contribute to them. I'll have more in time. There are always more ways to get hurt. But rather than try to run from the pain, I embrace it now. I try to understand it, and I let Jessica in on it too. That's why we have other people to help us with the pain. She's learning how to help without carrying the burden, though it doesn't always work. It's a process. After all, the deepest cuts don't come from a knife. Thank you for sharing my nightmares and helping me carry the grief. 
I'd like to thank everyone who's left a kind word or a phrase of encouragement in the comments. I read every one of them, and they mean the world to me. I'd also like to thank my patrons on Patreon, Mark and Grim and Darkness. If you'd like to join them and support my work on Nightmares and Grief, you can subscribe for $3 a month and cancel at any time. I post early episodes and offer insights into each story. If you like the show, please share your favorite nightmare with a friend or family member. You can also connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, or Threads. Just look for Nightmares and Grief and you'll find me. Thanks again for spending this time with me. Good night.